Hi everyone, Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical precious metals brokerage house specializing in gold and silver. Well, first we'd like to just say that our hearts and prayers are with everybody that's going through all the devastation from the hurricanes in Texas and Florida up the coast, and we hope that you're surviving it just fine. And that does bring us to our topic today, where we're going to take a look at the costs of natural disasters in terms of victims and taxpayers and insurance and even the economy. And I think that a hurricane could really be a pretty good metaphor for what's happening in the financial system as well. Because, you know, with, with a hurricane, Doppler radar can show you its approach. And we use techni uh, you know, the technicals as well as history to also show us the approach of the financial hurricane that's coming. Now you've got a choice once you know there's a storm afoot. You can either choose to prepare for it or you can choose to ignore it and hope that it does not hit. But, you know, quite frankly, which way do you think you would fare the best? And obviously, it's in preparation. So we're going to talk about Harvey because they were the hardest hit today, um, though Florida had some issues too. But particularly with Harvey, because that happened in the Golden Triangle, which is in Texas and in the area where most of the crude oil is refined. So you can see that, that well, that area was absolutely devastated. And President Trump proposed $7.85 billion in aid. But the, uh, but the governor of Texas said that they could require up to maybe $180 billion in aid. So there's a pretty big gap there, and we're going to come back to that. But going back to watching the approaching storm, I mean, it's the same thing. If you look at the Doppler radar, you can see in this dark blue area the hardest hit areas. And then for the those that were the victims that were um, the damages that were assessed during this, well, you could kind of think about this as the financial crisis that hit in 2008. And what did they focus on? Well, central banks focused on repairing the banks and the financial system, not repairing the public, but the financial system. It's really kind of the same thing. And if you weren't prepared for it, then you ended up in shelters. So financially, you could look at the fact that in 2008, let me look at my notes, there were 28 million people that were on food stamps. And the most current data in 2016, there are now 45.8 million people on food stamps. So here you have many thousands of people that are left homeless because of this hurricane. In fact, CoreLogic estimates that only 500 million is actually covered and that because private insurance, most people are uninsured there. But who picks up that slack because they're looking at 500 million where as you saw that you know they anticipate about 180 billion in damages so somebody's got to pick up that slack and that would be FEMA and inside of FEMA is the National Flood Insurance Program now their purpose is to subsidize and issue cheap flood insurance policies so that people can at least be covered um, in these floodplains but in Texas not many people are covered. Now, typically, an insurance company will make its money on the float. And the float is the difference between the premiums that they take in and the current benefits that they have to pay out. If you're a private corporation, a private insurance corporation, well, then you're going to make sure that that float is wide enough. And frankly, that's one of the ways that Warren Buffett got so wealthy was on the float from all the insurance companies that he owns. But when you get the government involved, they look at it a little bit differently. So according to SIBO, um, which is the, um, oh, Megan, 
which is the Commission. Uh, Congressional Budget Office, sorry about that. It's late in the day, I'm a little tired. But uh, the Congressional Budget Office, it, because of the way that FEMA anticipates and determines what their premiums are going to be, they are between the two issues like $1.4 billion short in anticipated benefits. And, and we're not even really talking about the full requirement. And according to the Government Accountability Office, they run a report on those uh, programs that are high risk. Well, guess what? That pro program has been high risk since 2006. And between the premiums, they expect right now, uh, right now we owe, or FEMA owes the Treasury $23 billion. Well, now they're adding on at least another $1.4 billion to that. Well, let's see. The Treasury Department loans that money, so who pays? That's the taxpayers. In addition, FEMA wants to go in and buy up those properties that are in repeat flood zones. I, I will admit it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go and repair it and then you're in a flood zone and you have to repair it over and over and over again. But there are 3,300 properties that are at, in, at risk in these repeated flood zones. So with FEMA already being underwater uh, to the tune of over $24 billion, where's that money going to come from? Now, this question originally came up because there were some concerns about the impact to Fannie and Freddie if people walked away from their homes and walked away from those mortgages. But with FEMA going in, they pay what is considered fair market for the property so that the displaced people can go and buy properties otherwise or other places and plus then there are loans if they do want to rebuild but we don't have to worry too much about Fannie and Freddie if FEMA with taxpayer dollars goes in and buys up those homes that are in those repeat flood zones. Now of course it's not just the displacement but we have to consider, again, going back to that golden triangle where you have, you know, I mean, remember, Texas is really in the epicenter of oil refining. And they process about a third of the American oil. And America produces, uh, is the third largest producer of oil in the world. So that is a pretty substantial hit, the fact that those refineries are offline. Goldman Sachs estimates that, that this hurricane has taken roughly 3 million barrels of oil off the market a day. So that's about 17%. That's pretty substantial. So what you would anticipate is that the price of oil would spike. And, hey, it certainly has at the gas pumps. It certainly performed that function and spiked quite a bit. But if you look at this chart, on uh, this is West Texas Sweet Crude, okay, initially, and you can see this here, initially, yes, there was a huge spike in the price. And remember, this is all coming at a time when they're trying to support the prices of oil because of the bankruptcies in, that, in the oil patch as well as the Aramco IPO coming out. So there are many things that are going on in oil. So we did indeed have that spike up. But that was actually really short-lived, and it started to drop again. So this is actually a bit of a problem for the oil patch. And also in this graph on this top, this is the oil rig count. And you can see that it could be topping out. The bottom line where you see this huge drop is the production. Of course, it would make sense. It's in the middle of a hurricane. So, we can see that there are a lot of costs that are going on there. It's the same thing with any kind of financial crisis. At first, it is deflationary because people aren't spending money there. Right now, they're looking, they're assessing the damages and trying to figure out even how to move forward. But once they do that, then it can actually stimulate the economy in the rebuilding process. So. I guess you could say that that would be one of the upsides. We're going to have to see how many people get displaced 
but what you're looking at here is from the Federal Reserve, and this is on the de the uh, deficits and surpluses, which you see since we went off the gold standard in 71, other than this little blip here, it's about running perpetual debt. This is what the deficit looked like in the middle of the crisis, and you can see this massive uh, drop downward. Then we had that nice little rise because that was all of the fines that the banks were paying that created the crisis. Nobody went to jail, but they did pay a lot of fines. However, even before the current crisis hit, and certainly going into the future crisis, you could see that downward trend in this uh, deficit graph. So how far down, you can see where it started here into the last financial crisis. What happens when we hit the next financial crisis? This is going to drop a whole lot more. And the debts, well, President Trump made a deal, so the debt ceiling discussion has been put off until December, but we have officially spiked over $20 trillion. So all of these... All of these natural disasters are going to be adding to both the debts and the deficits. And of course, you know, if it is about the individual people's lives at stake and people that are displaced, that's important. We have to be a community. We really have to help our neighbors. But it'll be interesting to see where that emergency money goes. And we'll kind of take a look at that as we move forward. So, that's it for today. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. If you like this, give it a thumbs up. And, and by the way, I have a new assistant. Her name is Megan, and she is making sure that I'm Twittering more. So if you have questions, that's also a good place to ask them because she's making me go there every day. I'm really grateful for it, something I needed to do. Uh, but that's a good place to go and ask your questions, make comments, etc. So if you like this, give us a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. And don't forget to give us a call at 888-696-4653. And please, everybody, be safe out there. Bye-bye.